Our second scripture reading is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen to the word of God. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Well, as Bill was talking about in his children's sermon, today is Epiphany Sunday. An epiphany is one of those aha moments when you find something you couldn't find before, when you realize or understand something that was hidden to you before. Theologically speaking, an epiphany is when God is made manifest or is found by somebody or a group of somebodies who had not known him before. So today we are celebrating exactly that, that God, who previously had only been known and worshipped by his people Israel or by the Gentiles through his people Israel, now made himself known to all the nations, specifically when he sent signs to bring the wise men, Gentiles, to come and worship Christ, the newborn King. The light of Christ has come into our dark world, and as Isaiah foretold in our first passage, nations came to that light, kings to the brightness of its rising. And this story of the coming of the wise men is a story of incredible contrasts. There are three distinct reactions to the birth of Jesus in this particular passage. The first being the reaction of the wise men themselves, or to use the technical term which we sometimes use, the magi. Now, contrary to our first hymn, which I love, magi were not kings. They were advisors to kings, specifically Uh, They were courtiers, advisors, uh, workers for the kings of Persia, modern-day Iran. These were men of learning, men of holiness. These were experts, men of wisdom, men who were skilled and educated in many fields of study, from philosophy to medicine, from astronomy to the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, but also 
experts in many non-scientific subjects as well, like astrology, soothsaying, magic. We actually get our English word magic from these magi. Now, you may be scratching your head and saying, why would God bother with people who practice these kinds of practices? They are strictly forbidden in the Bible. We, as believers, are to have nothing to do with magic or consulting the dead or astrology or any of those kinds of practices. But again, that's part of the wonder of this day, that God would reveal himself to these pagan worshipers of other gods people who did not know or follow his way. And these particular magi, we don't know how many there were. Often people assume there were three because there were three gifts, but it could have been a whole caravan. Matthew doesn't specify for us. These particular magi were watching the stars for a sign. And the reason is, when you read the histories of this particular era, the first century BC and the first century AD, there was, we find from a variety of authors writing at this time, there was this common accepted idea that something big was about to happen. There was this common accepted belief all around the known world that a king, a savior, was going to be born specifically in Judea. It's remarkable when you read about this. The Romans believed this, they believed this in the East, and they were all waiting for this to happen. And these wise men were watching the stars. That's the way they understood this. They were watching for a sign, and God accommodated to them. God showed them something. We don't know exactly what it was. There are all kinds of theories. We're not going to go into them today. But God showed them something that led them to believe that this Savior, this King that they were waiting for, had been born. And here's the key. They saw the sign, and they believed it, and they acted upon it. And oh my goodness, how they acted upon it. They took an incredible journey. Now, we don't know where exactly they came from, but if they're coming from the Persia area all the way to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem, that could easily have been a journey of a thousand miles. And folks, they didn't, they didn't catch an airplane. They didn't take the train. There's no direct interstate highway from Persia down to Jerusalem. This was a long, hard journey. When you think about the journey that these men took, the time that they spent, the energy that they expended, the disruption to their lives that they underwent, this is an absolutely incredible act of devotion and obedience. And when they arrived, They presented costly gifts to this newborn king. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. All of those rare, expensive commodities, luxury items. You you didn't just run down to the local Walgreens to pick up frankincense, okay? It was extremely rare. It still is rare and costly today. These men brought their best And when they found Jesus, they fell on their feet, knees, they laid their gifts at his feet. Now, we're kind of used to seeing something like that in our nativity scenes, but but don't trivialize this. This is an absolutely flabbergasting scene to have these VIPs, these wealthy men, these learned men, these magicians, pagans, not worshipers of God, falling down on their knees and presenting offerings and gifts to this Jewish peasant child. It's absolutely amazing. These are the last people anybody would have expected to come and worship the Messiah. And yet they did. And they received an incredible gift they got to see 
their maker. They got to worship the one true God. Folks, when you read about the description of what we are still waiting for, life in the new heavens and the new earth, when Jesus returns, that's what it's going to be like. We're going to see our God face to face, and we're going to worship Him. These magi got a foretaste of paradise because they saw the signs. They were searching for the signs. They recognized them, they believed them, and they acted upon them, and they received an incredible blessing that we are still talking about today. But not everybody acted in this way. Matthew tells us that before making their way to Bethlehem, first, the wise men stopped in Jerusalem. It's an understandable error to make. Bethlehem and Jerusalem are not that far apart. And if you were searching for the newborn king of the Jews, wouldn't you go where the king lives? Wouldn't you go to the palace in the capital city in Jerusalem? So these wise men, you can imagine this caravan coming into town, everybody noticing this, and then they start asking questions. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? Everybody gets stirred up by this, especially the current king of the Jews, King Herod. And here's the thing, Herod believed the wise men. He believed that a new king had been born, but he didn't receive that as good news. For Herod, that was bad news. Herod was a notoriously paranoid man, a jealous man. When we read the first century accounts of King Herod, we find that he was a murderous, evil, wicked king. He's called Herod the Great because he did great things like rebuilding the temple and making it a a tourist destination, making it magnificent again. But his character was reprehensible. We know he killed at least two of his wives and several of his sons because he suspected them of plotting against him, trying to take away his power and his throne. Herod got such a reputation in the first century that the current emperor, Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, famously quipped that he would rather be Herod's pig than be Herod's son. That's quite a reputation to have. So the current king was not happy to hear that a new king had been born. A new king meant a threat to his throne, a threat to his power, a threat to his way of life. A new king meant a change in the status quo. Well, it always does, doesn't it, when Jesus comes into your life? It always means the status quo is going to change. Because if Jesus is king over your life, guess who doesn't get to be king over your life? You don't get to be king anymore. You don't get to sit on the throne anymore and make decisions for what is right or wrong for you or good or bad for you. Jesus now has to do that. And Herod didn't want anything to do with that. He didn't want a new king. And he did everything in his power to get rid of this new king. And we heard last week in our scripture readings, the second half of Matthew chapter 2, just how far Herod went to get rid of this newborn king of the Jews. He ordered the execution of all little boy babies who had been born in Bethlehem up to the age of two. He got rid of every child that might possibly be this foretold, prophesied Savior, Messiah, new king. It's called the slaughter of the innocents. And these are the lengths that Herod went to to get rid of the newborn king of the Jews. And because of this, Mary and Joseph and Jesus, who had been warned in a dream about this, had to flee the country. They had to go and become refugees living in Egypt for the first year or so of Jesus' life until Herod died and it was safe again to go back to 
the promised land, go back to Israel. They eventually went up and settled in Nazareth where they lived. But this is Herod's reaction to the birth of Jesus. And like the people who crucified Jesus, again, to try to get rid of him, to get them out of their lives, he didn't care who he hurt in the process. And ironically, he ended up hurting himself the most. But there's a third reaction in this passage as well. And that's the reaction of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. The wise men came into Jerusalem asking a very simple question. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? When Herod heard this, he summoned his wise men, his advisors, the Bible scholars, the people who knew the Bible backwards and forwards. And he asked them, where is the Savior, the Messiah, going to be born? Don't you find it interesting that he didn't know? He had to ask. But these scribes, these chief priests, these Bible scholars, these theologians, they knew exactly where Jesus was going to be born. Oh, the prophet Micah tells us in chapter 5, the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem in the city of David. So they knew where to go. Now walk through this with me. These scribes, these scholars, these learned men knew that something had happened big enough to convince the Magi that the Savior had been born. To convince them enough to make this incredible journey of hundreds, if not a thousand miles, to come and find him. They knew where to go. They knew to go to Bethlehem. And by the way, Bethlehem from Jerusalem is a journey of about four to six miles. It's like going from Harrison to Bright. They didn't have to travel days, weeks, months. They didn't have to travel hundreds of miles. They had to go five miles. And as far as we know, They didn't go. As far as we know, not one of them made the journey to seek out the newborn king of the Jews. These religious professionals, these men who knew the Bible backwards and forwards and inside out, they couldn't be bothered to travel a few miles down the road to find the one that the Bible is all about. The one that they've been reading about and studying about all their lives. They didn't believe. They didn't care. They couldn't be bothered. They knew the scriptures. The scriptures were their life, but they didn't know God. They didn't love God. They weren't devoted to God. They had all the information they needed, but somehow they missed their chance. Somehow they were so wrapped up in their own lives in what they had to do that they missed what God was doing in their midst. The Magi were seeking the signs. They saw the signs. They believed them. They acted upon them. The scribes and the priests couldn't be bothered to go down the road and find the one that God had sent for them, and they missed the blessing. Now, we have a brand new year in front of us. The year of our Lord 2018. And the story is just as true now as it was then. Jesus Christ has been born for us. And in fact, we know more of the story. He lived for us. He died for us. He rose again from the dead for us. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And from thence, he shall come someday, and it could be soon, to judge the quick and the dead. Now, how are we going to react to this news? What choices are we going to make to respond to what God has done in our midst? And making no choice at all, as we see in this passage, is in itself to make a choice. It's to make a choice not to seek after Jesus. And that's the key. We must seek after Jesus. 
We must seek him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We must seek him with all of the resources that God has put at our disposal. We must be intentional in the choices we make and how we live out our faith. Because here's the thing, we make time for the things that are important to us. Is Jesus Christ truly important to you? Will you seek him as the wise men did this year? Will you seek him in prayer every day? Every day, will you make the choice? Will you make the time? Will you make the space in your life to seek after God, to hear what he has to say, to lift up your concerns to him? Will you make the time, will you make an appointment in your schedule? Will you take your prayers, not just here and there whenever it happens to occur to you, will you take it to the next level, make it a scheduled appointment in your day? Will you make space in your house for your prayer closet, a space dedicated to seeking the Lord, where you have your Bible and your lists and your bulletin list and your journal, your cards, your books, whatever you use to help you grow in prayer with the Lord? Will you seek Jesus Christ intentionally this year? Will you seek Jesus Christ through His Word through the scriptures. He has made himself known in this book. This is his word. This is 90 to 95% of the time how he speaks to us. Will you seek him? Make space in your life to read the word, to think about what you have read, to learn it, to study it, to ponder it. Will you take your scripture reading to the next level this year? Will you find a Bible reading plan to follow? There are all kinds of Bible reading plans free online. I could find one for you. Whatever your your needs are, you want to read the Bible in six months, in a year, in three years, all of those plans are available. All you have to do is follow them. Will you commit to come to Sunday school to learn the Bible better, to come to Bible study, to come to heart to heart? Will you seek Jesus through his word? Will you seek him in worship every week, every day, intentionally giving thanks for all your blessings? Will you seek Jesus through service? Will you join a committee? The committees in our congregation is where things happen. You have ideas for things that need to happen? Join the committee and make sure it happens. Will you seek Jesus through reaching out to somebody in need? We have shut-ins. We have people in our congregation who are lonely, who are grieving, who need rides, who need help. Will you be the one to befriend them, to seek to be like Jesus in your life, to seek to obey Jesus in your life, to reach out as Jesus Christ to that person? Will you seek Jesus through obedience? Will you cut out that habit that you really like, that you know is getting in the way of your relationship with God, that you know displeases Him? Will you start a new holy habit? Will you start bringing food to our food baskets downstairs that every month, every week often get taken over to Christ-loving hands and distributed to the food pantries in Harrison? Will you start participating every second Sunday in Two Cents a Meal, which funds the meals that Christine was telling us about that we are now doing monthly? Will you participate in bringing the items that we are collecting each month in our Love Thy Neighbor collections? Will you commit every month to invite somebody to come to worship with you, your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, somebody that doesn't have a church home? Will you commit every month to talking to somebody that you know doesn't believe about why you believe, not in an obnoxious way, but just bearing witness, bearing testimony to why you believe and challenging them on why they don't? Will you evangelize? Will you commit to tithing or to being more generous in your giving? Will you make 
the steps, the choices this year to seek Jesus Christ the way the wise men did. Because what the wise men show us is that seeking Jesus means seeking him with all of our being, all of our resources, our time, our talents, our treasures. It means bringing our best to the Lord. And this new year, we have an opportunity, we have a choice. Will we seek Jesus or not? There are many, like Herod, who are threatened by Jesus. They're doing everything they can to get rid of him. They attack him publicly in the news. They attack the church. It's not just happening in the nasty parts of the world. It's happening in the United States, too. People are doing everything they can to get rid of Jesus Christ in our society. But there are even more who just can't be bothered. There are even more who don't care what God is doing in our world. They're too busy living their lives. They're too busy living for themselves. And they may even say they believe in God, but it makes no difference in their life. It's like the way I believe the planet Neptune exists. I believe it's out there somewhere, but it doesn't make a difference in my life. I'm not changing the way I live because of my belief in the planet Neptune. That's the way so many people believe in God. They believe he exists, but they're not seeking him. They don't know him. They don't have a relationship with him. There's no fruit in their lives. We have an opportunity to make a better choice this year. We have an opportunity to be wise to join in that journey that those wise men took. This is our epiphany moment. Will we seize upon it this year? For Jesus Christ has been born for us. He lived and he died for us. One day he's coming again. Will we make the commitment to seek a relationship with him, to seek his light, to seek his will for our lives? to seek all that he has to give. The choice is yours. And no one else can make that choice for your life except you. Choose wisely. And to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you have made yourself known, that you have made a relationship with you a reality. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and courage to seek you more and more this year. And as we prepare to come to your table, we ask that you would nourish us for this. In Jesus' name, amen.